Crisis Remastered, out now on Switch, and I'm sure you've already seen John's excellent review. One of the most technologically demanding games of all time not only runs pretty well, it manages to do so in handheld mode, a situation where a lot of games fall short. Fascinating stuff, but even so, there's the sense that in some areas of the game, Crisis is still indeed a potent challenge, perhaps too demanding in places for Nintendo's console hybrid. This isn't a slight against developers Crytek or Sabre Interactive as such, because let's be honest, every one of these impossible Switch ports has its compromises, and clearly it's the Switch itself that is the bottleneck. But you know what? All of this made me wonder. The Switch has been exploited, hacked. Its Tegra X1 chipset can be overclocked in both CPU and GPU vectors. In fact, the evidence suggests that when performance is compromised, Crisis Remastered is clearly CPU limited, and with the power of system level overclocking available, we can actually add 75% more frequency to the ARM CPU cores. So let me share with you the fun I've been having over the last few days. So for this video, let's talk content. Firstly, we're going to OC the switch and see what happens to Crisis Remastered when we have the fully armed and operational Tegra X1 running at full Nvidia spec. Not only that, we're going to dip into the game's file structure. Hidden therein, you'll see config files that allow us to tweak CryEngine settings. We can adjust LOD transitions, vegetation and water quality, and a lot more. So the question is, what level of tweakability is there? And can we actually improve the look of the game and maintain performance given the extra CPU and GPU power a hacked switch can deliver? By extension, with access to the config files, I had to wonder, could we re-enable a couple of the features that we found to be missing from the Switch port of Crisis Remastered. I mean, in his review, John talked about the lack of parallax occlusion mapping, the process by which a certain degree of 3D-ness, for want of a better word, can be added to flat textures. He also talked about the simplification of volumetric lighting. I mean, Switch has volumetrics, but they're not quite what they were. So I decided to look into that. I guess at the end of the day, the dream would be to tweak settings, re-enable features, and perhaps, just perhaps, get some idea of the scalability that will be available to Crisis Remastered on the higher end consoles. Well, <laughs> as we shall discover, this is likely not the case, but I still found the exercise to be intriguing nonetheless. Oh yeah, and uh, remember how Crisis Remastered had a slightly balked frame rate cap? It's supposed to be 30 frames per second, but in actuality, it seems to be running at 31 frames per second, meaning the game runs with off-frame pacing and a stutter you can't really get rid of. I wanted to see if we could improve matters there, and again, the results were fascinating. But let's kick off by talking about how we're able to get an insight into how Crisis is working internally. Homebrew for exploited switches is pretty advanced these days, and it means that for Digital Foundry, we have unprecedented access to internal information running a game within a current generation console. The Tesla overlay system is a pretty big example of how advanced Switch Homebrew is these days. Pressing the left shoulder button down and pressing down on the right stick brings up plugins that offer various visualizations and options. Sysclock for overclocking used to be an application that you'd run outside of a game, but now with the Tesla overlay system, you can tweak CPU, GPU, and memory clocks in real time, in game. And uh, Reverse NX is the same. What was once an outside app is now accessible while you're in game. And actually, this app is very cool and very useful. You can swap between docked and handheld game configurations at will. Now, for Crisis Remastered, this only tends to affect shadow detail and resolution, but for our work, Getting access to both configurations via the HDMI port does have some degree of value. But most interesting of all is System Overlay, which is essentially, for want of a better phrase, Reva Tuna Statistics Server for Switch. You can monitor CPU, GPU and memory clocks, temperatures and fan speed. In John's Crisis video, you got a glimpse of the full monitor board there, but I'm going to be using the mini version. So essentially we get to see a lot more of the actual game. 
There, you can see the relevant clock speeds, but also CPU and GPU utilization and memory consumption. Remember, the Switch has four gigs of RAM, but only about three and a half gigs or thereabouts are accessible to developers. Temperature and fan data? Well, this tells us how much hotter our Switch is getting when we overclock it and how much faster the fan has to work to keep temperatures in check. In terms of the CPU there, you'll note that there are four cores, each with utilization in percentage terms. The first three cores, 0 to 2, are given over to the game, while core 3 on the far right there is used by the operating system and background apps. So look, we can access Switch's docked and handheld modes at will. We can massively overclock the system, and we can monitor exactly how the Switch is stressed by the game in real time. Now it's time to see what we can actually do with all of this stuff. And I'm going to start off by highlighting general CPU utilization. Three available cores, and it's pretty rare that the game isn't running in the high 90s in percentage terms on at least one core. And quite often, you can see that across all three. So that's why Crisis Remastered tends to run much the same in docked and handheld modes. CPU clocks on the Switch are always at 1 GHz in both TV and mobile play. And it looks like Crytek and Saber Interactive did a good job on scaling graphics. They don't seem to be the limiting factor for performance. The rendering setup, animation, physics, background streaming and AI, those are the main challenges for the Switch. First order of business, getting to grips with CPU scalability and Mission 2. So in the village here, we've got a wide open area with a ton of enemy AI in place, and it's one of the hotspots in the game that causes performance limits owing to CPU bottlenecking. We're tracking performance here in docked mode with GPU at stock 768 MHz and CPU likewise at the standard 1020 MHz. You can see that frame rate pretty variable. So to what extent does CPU overclocking improve matters? Now, actually replicating like-for-like -like loads on the system is difficult because by its very nature, Crisis is a game where the battlefield is open, where AI behavior changes from run to run. But at the end of this level, you find yourself battling two tanks. I like to take out the first from the rooftop, like this, and you can see how the frame rate improves by overclocking from stock clocks to the Tegra X1 standard 1785 MHz. It's clearly significantly smoother, but still not quite perfect. Still, it's interesting to note here that an extra 75% of CPU frequency gets us about 38% of extra performance. Yes, locking to 30 frames per second would be great, but let's just keep things in perspective here. Crisis still challenges a modern x86 gaming CPU, and here we're running it on a five-year-old mobile chipset. An even better test with more closely synchronized action is here. You can pick up a second rocket launcher to take out the second tank, but I prefer to do things a little differently by catching the tank in the explosion caused by blowing up the petrol station. This causes big performance challenges and it does seem to be readily repeatable. And what we see confirms the CPU bottleneck again. And uh, once more, we don't see performance scaling with frequency. The gain this time actually seems to be a bit smaller, 26% at best. Now I'm wondering if that huge explosion is perhaps depressing performance in memory bandwidth terms too. Still, as I said, 1785 MHz is actually the stock clock for the Tegra X1 in Nvidia's Shield Android TV. Compared with stock clocks, there's still a good chunk of extra performance. So clearly the Switch is capable of delivering this, so why aren't we getting this in our Nintendo consoles? Well, chances are it's all down to power consumption and battery life. And that's the thing really, what I found in previous overclocking tests is that arguably the 1 GHz CPU in Switch is its biggest architectural weakness. Switch developers have access to the 1224 MHz CPU mode to give them some overhead for debugging tools and whatnot, but actual extra CPU power in-game is only available to developers to decrease loading speeds, otherwise we're still stuck at 1 GHz. Meanwhile, Nintendo has unlocked more GPU performance in mobile mode and Crisis actually taps into that. The original spec for mobile mode pre-launch was 307 megahertz. It was up to 384 megahertz for launch and now power titles can access a 460 megahertz GPU clock, Crisis included. 
a good move by Nintendo, I'd say, but I kind of wish it was being more generous with the CPU as well. Here's that second test again with the petrol station, this time with three potential clock configs. There's not much gain moving from 1581 MHz to full fat 1785, so yeah, I do wonder if we are indeed hitting another bottleneck at this point. Crisis legendarily is a bit of a monster, and it still is on Switch. It's eating up a lot of the extra clocks that I give it via overclocking, but in other titles I've seen some pretty decent returns just with a 1224 MHz CPU overclock. I really wish developers could access that officially. Next up, let's talk modding. I'm interested in this because, well, crisis on PC. In latter years, it's all been about the modding, right? Obviously, the leeway to do so on Switch is going to be minimal. We're not going to be swapping in high resolution texture packs, for example. But I was curious to see if we could restore parallax occlusion maps and OG volumetrics, as there do seem to be variables in the config files to tweak there. But before we do that, there's a bigger fish to fry. Crisis has a frame rate limiter set to 30 FPS, but as we know from John's review, that actually manifests as 31 FPS in actuality. And now you can change the variable. It does have an impact. So first of all, 29 FPS. This has been identified by Switch models as the sweet spot. But is it really? Well, side by side, you can see here that the frame pacing does seem to be improved. The 16 millisecond frame time spikes that are so apparent with the 30 FPS preset are much reduced at 29 FPS. And obviously our real life frame rate here is closer to an actual 30 frames per second. That said, I'm hoping for a better solution from Crytek itself. I'm not sure if it's a cure-all as such, as it looks to me like we may be getting more 50 millisecond dips as a result of that tweak too. Oh, and of course, uh, you're going to ask what happens if we try to push frame rate to the max 60 FPS. And that's what I'm doing here with a max overclock. 1785 MHz CPU, 921 MHz GPU in handheld mode to constrain resolution and shadow quality and to pump out more performance. You can't actually get anything more than 45 frames per second from the Switch, even in very basic scenarios like looking at the sky. Frame rate is higher generally, but when you hit a stutter, its impact is actually far, far worse than it would be usually. It's not an optimal way to play, but an interesting experiment nonetheless. The modding situation in terms of improved quality settings makes for lean pickings, really. First of all, I tried re-enabling parallax occlusion mapping, but even with the setting enabled in the Switch config, it's not active. Now, that's not to say it can't be activated, but it's likely that much of the game's setup is baked in based on those stock config settings. So, for example, why would the developers go to the bother of generating parallax occlusion maps if they're not actually specified to be required in game? Similarly, you're not going to be seeing much improvement in volumetrics. I did a bunch of comparisons on like-for-like -like footage taken with the stock config and then with all settings maxed as far as the CryEngine documentation says that they can be maxed. And I think overall the developers got the balance right. You can improve level of detail transitions, water quality and shadow quality, but in the run of play the effect is mostly rather subtle. Ultimately though, perhaps rather foolishly, I thought that maxing everything could possibly offer up a hint of what we might expect on the PS4 and Xbox One versions of Crisis Remastered. But an interview from Nintendo Everything with Crytek's Stefan Halbig lays out some home truths. First of all, the reason why other versions of the game were delayed but not the Switch version is the suggestion that this release of Crisis Remastered is somewhat different to the others. We're told about a different pipeline and a different developer in charge of the port. So my takeaway is that like many Switch ports, Dark Souls Remastered for example, well, Crisis Remastered on Switch may have commonalities with other versions, but it's very much its own entity. And while I can't add much in the way of new features via Switch modding, our own discussions with Crytek and indeed the content of the Nintendo Everything interview do suggest that the developer isn't done with the game yet. There's talk of parallax occlusion mapping coming back as a docked only feature, for example, in a later patch. So, in the meantime, Let's celebrate the game for what it is and what it has achieved. Clearly CPU limitations are an issue, but even so, as John said in his review, generally 
this does run better than the last gen versions of the game and you're getting those lovely lighting improvements to boot. John was playing on PS3 there to make the point but I've used Xbox 360 for my comparison which I think generally runs a bit better than its Sony counterpart and certainly delivers a higher resolution. So check this out, I've used my hacked switch to run the docked graphics mode at mobile clocks. Dynamic resolution scaling will likely be closer to lower bounds and it all drop frames when it can't go lower. But the extra docked features are being rendered with just 60% of its usual GPU power and with reduced memory bandwidth. And you know what? Switch is still holding up pretty well in my opinion. More than holding its own against Xbox 360 in many scenarios. And remember, while the Switch has a more modern GPU, its ARM CPU cluster isn't really a match for the 360's triple core 3.2 GHz PowerPC CPU with hyperthreading. Interesting to note that Xbox 360 still loses a ton of its performance in the same areas as Switch though. Wide open spaces with lots of enemy AI are clearly a problem, just as they were in the PC original actually. But it's this concept that Switch can better the last gen experience that I find fascinating. And I don't think this is the end of the story. Crytek doesn't rule out Crisis 2 and Crisis 3 appearing on Switch. I mean, non-committal responses are par for the course. But when Crisis Remastered was announced, tweets from Sabre Interactive's Tim Willits, now deleted, did kind of suggest that the entire trilogy of campaigns was in development. Maybe those tweets were deleted because they were untrue or maybe uh, the situation just was not fully confirmed at that point. But I do hope to see more Crisis on Switch with lessons learnt from Crisis Remastered. And yes, hopefully more of those impressive feature ports from higher end CryEngines will make their way into the conversions. I mean, you look at the performance of those games on the last gen systems and there's so much scope for improvement here and the opportunity to do it all on a handheld I'm all in on that idea. For now though, at least, the emphasis is still on Crisis 1 and its remastered re-emergence on PC, Xbox One and PS4. And maybe, if enough homage is paid to the Crisis Shrine, we'll get Series X and PS5 versions too. But that's all from me for now. Please do like, subscribe and share if you enjoyed the content. And of course, we have that bell for ringing and I urge you to do so if you want instant notifications whenever we post new Digital Foundry content. And of course, the DF Patreon. That's there for those that love what we do and want to support the team more directly. In return, you'll get pristine quality downloads of everything we do. That's all from me for now. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of this one, if indeed you did. And just generally thanks for watching and supporting Digital Foundry.